All right, everybody, welcome back to Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. Pretty excited to continue on. Uh, we had uh, an interesting talk last week about endocarditis, and today we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're doing a lot about a cardiac stuff uh, recently, and about this time of year, we kind of start switching to other topics, right? Other things kind of in that spectrum of, of things that we can do with the bedside and the armamentarium, armamentarium of tools that we have. And so today... We are going to talk about ultrasound guided venous access, right? This is something that we really haven't covered much on the channel before, um, but something that's definitely within the wheelhouse of what we do with the ultrasound, because not only do we do diagnostic ultrasound, but we can also do procedural guided ultrasound. And one of the, the lines that one of my colleagues likes to use is if you can do a procedure blindly, you can do it better with ultrasound. And so today we're going to learn about how we can use ultrasound to help enhance our ability to ultrasound guided venous access. So with that being said, let's switch on over to our discussion for today and talk about an introduction to ultrasound guided venous access, right? And so if you go back and look in the literature, there's a ton of articles out there about ultrasound guided vascular access, right? This is something that you know, I even did a quick, quick PubMed today, you know, of ultrasound guided um you know, venous access. And there's just a ton of, of articles that popped up. You know, I pulled out a Cochrane review and there's, there's all these different areas where they're just, there's research on every little nuance of, of what articles, you know, from who does the procedure, whether it be a, a doctor or a nurse or a medic, or what approach do you use, whether short axis or long axis or, you know, superficial deep, you know, how, what length catheter, how long these things stay in. Like there's all sorts of research in this area uh, of ultrasound guided venous axis. And it supports the idea that this is a tool that we can use to better the care that we provide for our patients, particularly for those who have difficult venous access, right? And this is one of the things that comes out in some of the literature as well as just clinical experiences. When you have poor venous access, right? Whether you're a difficult patient for whatever reason, it is, and you can't get that IV, you know, line established, it really delays care uh, in, the, in the care that we can provide for patients. And it also ties up resources in the department that can be then otherwise utilized elsewhere, meaning their our, our nurses, right? So if our nurses in there struggling for 20 minutes trying to get a line, that's 20 minutes they can't be doing other things. Whereas if I can come in, you know, in five minutes and pop in a line with an ultrasound, that frees up that 15 minutes that gets the patient 15 minutes sooner towards their interventions. And it really provides benefit all the way around. And so I think there's a lot of ways that we can say the, the literature supports the use of bedside ultrasound to um, enhance our venous access. And so that's kind of the topic that we're going to talk about today and a little bit about, or and give a little bit of an intro about how we get this done, right? And so with that being said, we're going to break things down into a few basic categories. And the first thing that we need to understand is some venous anatomy, right? Uh, and once we understand the anatomy, then we can start layering on top the ultrasound in the procedure and how we put the two together to really get this outcome at the end of, I have a catheter and it's now in the patient's vessel, right? So from an anatomy standpoint, um, we're going to focus in primarily on the upper extremity, right? The arm uh, for our peripheral venous axis. Now you can talk you know, for a, a good long while about central access, right? And that's certainly a, a valid topic of conversation. And the same principles apply, right? Um, in terms of what vessel, you know, you're using uh, how you use the, the tool, but it's a different, like what vessels you use and how you approach and stuff like that. And so there's nuances there, but today we're going to talk about peripheral access. And so we're going to talk specifically about the arm, because I would venture to say that most IVs probably go in patients' arms. It's just an extremity that's got veins that are easy to access and it's, you know, movable and you can you can put it in there, right? It's a lot easier to access than some other places. And so um, this and the following images are are taken from this this app, uh, Complete Anatomy. If you haven't seen that app, it's pretty amazing. It's a 3D um, an, an anatomy software that you can manipulate and turn on and off layers. And so uh, this image is from their app um, showing the, the venous uh, access of the arm, right? But we want to focus in specifically kind of around the antecubital fossa, right? Um, there's a lot of veins that run in the forearm, right? But the, a lot of places where we go when we have difficult access is somewhere around this antecubital fossa, right? And there's several veins uh, that we need to familiarize ourselves with, right? And so if you think about it, there's a bunch of veins that come up the forearm, right? And then there's this Y junction uh, in the middle of the antecubital fossa, right? And so you have that central vein that Ys off to those two lateral veins, right? Um, and so 
the one on the left you see there is called the cephalic vein, right? That's the vein that runs up your bicep. So when you go to the gym and see someone who's been working out a lot, you see that that vein on the, the front edge of their bicep that's really obvious and out there. Um, that's the cephalic vein, the anterior cephalic vein, right? A little bit more to the medial side of the arm, kind of tucked inside the arm, is the basilic vein. But those run up um, along the long axis of the arm uh, up towards the shoulder, right? Um, now, interestingly, that Y junction connects those two. And those uh, those junctions, the, the legs of the Y, are called the median cubital veins, right? And they form kind of that nexus kind of as you go down uh, distally on the arm to, to form that bottom of the Y. And you do have some, you know, um, distal um basilic and distal cephalic veins that come attach up to kind of have those uh, additional side legs that join with the Y. Uh, but these are some of the main veins that we're going to look at. And deep to all that, you see that complex that has the artery in two veins, and that's the brachial artery and veins, right? There's two veins, one artery, and that's usually me a little bit deeper, um, you know, you know, underneath some of that the fascial and the muscular tissue there. Uh, and we'll see those on our ultrasound, right? So as we talk about anatomy, the veins that we're really going to be targeting are any of the forearm veins, right? They're not necessarily specifically named, at least in this context, you know, I, or those median cubital veins, right? Those, those Y branches. And then you have your, um, your basilic and cephalic running up the side of the arm and then that brachial vein a little bit deeper to that. And so when we put the probe on, we can actually follow these veins uh, and see kind of how they how they go, right? And so this clip is gonna show you um, the median cubital to the cephalic vein. So remember, it's kind of in the middle of the AC fossa running to the lateral side uh, of the arm. So you can see it's branching off there and now it leaves you with that cephalic vein. So there's median cubital, but you can see the Y branching off and it becomes that cephalic vein. Um, so that's going to be one of the veins that we can look for and we can target when we do our, our ultrasound guided vascular access, right? Here's the example of the brachial artery and vein. So you can see it's a little bit deeper. You can see that, uh, pulsatile central vein, right? In, or excuse me, central artery. And you can see some veins surrounding that, um, that's going to have that, uh, that vas that vascular bundle there. Now, this is one of the areas where we're going to see an accompanying nerve, right? So this may limit some of the, our desire and ability to go there. Um, but it's a vein that's accessible to us in this context, right? And then if we look, here's a, um, I apologize, the, the header kind of got messed up, but the median um, cubital going to the basilic vein. And so you can see it's coming off, going lateral, and it joins up to the basilic right there. So median cubital to the basilic right there. And it goes continues up the medial aspect of the arm. So usually what I like to do, if you notice in there, kind of in the center of the screen, you can see the brachial artery and veins, right? Um, so the basilic, if you find that and then just wrap your probe around medially towards the inside of someone's arm, you'll find it's generally this ginormous, large, relative to other vessels, basilic vein kind of on the inner aspect of their upper arm, right? And so these are the various different veins that we're going to be targeting. Um, but I think it's appropriate for us to talk a little bit about artery versus vein. And some of this comes maybe intuitively, some of this you may have heard before, but for those who haven't, um, a little bit of a differentiation of artery versus vein. Veins and arteries obviously are vascular structures, right? They're gonna be filled with blood. And so by definition, they should, unless they're thrombosed, should be anechoic, right? You should have kind of a black lumen uh, of both of these structures. However, veins, in contrast to arteries, tend to be thin-walled. Remember, the artery has those three different layers, right? The intima, the media, and the adventitia. Uh, the veins tend to be thinner-walled, right? Because they don't have as developed of, an, uh, of, a, of a media layer. Uh, and because they're low volume or not low volume, but low pressure, they tend to be collapsible. So if you put a little bit of probe pressure on the veins, you'll see those veins collapse down um, and, and you can get the anterior and posterior edges of those walls to touch. And that really is the definition uh, of a vein, right? Uh, it also tends to be non-pulsatile, though you can make an argument that as you get more uh, close to, or more, more closely positioned to the central circulation, right, to the heart, uh, you may have some reflected pulsatility in those venous structures. And so um, out in the periphery, they tend to not pulse. But, you know, when you get closer up, you know, talking about the IVC and things like that, uh, you're going to have some pulsatility. So it becomes a little less uh, diagnostic, per se, to say that pulsatility is definitively, um, you know, pushes one way or the other. But generally out in the periphery, uh, if it's something's pulsatile, thick-walled, and non-compressible, it's an artery. And if something's thin-walled, compressible, and non-pulsatile, it tends to be a vein, Right. 
And so those are uh, the characters that we're looking for. Contrast that with the artery here, the one in the center. It's a little bit thicker wall. You can see that pulsatility. Obviously, I'm not showing compressibility, but if I did, you'd see the veins around it collapse and the artery uh, remain patent. Um, now you can make an argument. It's like, yeah, but if I press hard enough, I can collapse the artery. Uh, or if they're hypotensive enough, I could collapse the artery. And you would be right in saying that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, veins collapse at a much lower pressure, probe pressure, than arteries will collapse, right? And so those are features that you can use to differentiate one versus the other, right? So with that anatomical perspective in mind, let's talk a little bit about the equipment that we need to do this procedure, right? Um, because obviously you need the patient, right? You need their anatomy, but you need to set up your equipment uh, to be able to get this done and set it up in an efficient way so that you can optimally get this thing in. And that's the, thing, the key I've found is it's not just having the stuff there and knowing the fundamentals of how it works. It's really set the, setting up the, the equipment in the right place, in the right order, getting everything optimized so that you're ready to go. That's one of the keys to success, um, not just you know, knowing that you can do it. Right. And so the first thing uh, that you need is obviously going to be a machine. Right. And so uh, this is a picture of uh, one of our machines that we have here in the department. Uh, and this machine that we bought specifically for ultrasound guided procedures. So it has one probe, right? it has the linear probe uh, and it's, you know, one machine you can cart it around you can get it in small space and it's, it's designed um, in our usage for procedures. Right. And so, um, you need a machine. Uh, and then generally speaking, since the vascular structures that we're going for tend to be per, per, relatively superficial relative to other things, right? You want the uh, high frequency linear transducer. And so just as a reminder, the high frequency linear transducer um, is a high resolution because of its, of its high frequency, right? It gives you a uh, better resolution, but shallower ability to, to penetrate, right? You don't get to penetrate as much. You get shallower depth, right? Compare that or contrast that with the curvilinear. It's going to be a lower frequency transducer. So you're going to gain penetration, but you're going to sacrifice a lot of that resolution. And so in this situation, since the structures we want tend to be relatively superficial uh, and um you know, they're small, we want to maximize our resolution, um, knowing that we're going to compromise the depth that we can achieve because we really don't need it, right? So that's the machine that we need. Uh, the next is going to be um, the stuff to help with disinfection, right? And so one of the things that uh, comes into play here is how do you prevent hospital acquired infections, right? Because we are obviously using a device on a patient and those patients may have bacteria on them that we don't want to transmit to other people, right? Um, and so the um, there's various different, um, you know, guidelines out there um, that recommend various different levels of disinfection um, for uh, different things that we do. And so uh, we generally try to, try to follow the AIUM guidelines, uh, which differentiates things between, um, you know, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical devices. And so you're critical, you're talking about your OR level disinfection, you know, your, your sterilization. Uh, Semi-critical tends to be things that come into contact with mucous membranes or bodily fluids, uh, which tends to need um, high level disinfection. And then your non-critical, uh, which is basically your just regular scanning, um, which just needs a, a spray off. And so when you look at where ultrasound guided stuff falls on the, the spectrum, Generally speaking, most people agree uh, that a um, a probe cover, right, um, plus low level disinfection is is adequate for for disinfection for for ultrasound guided procedures, right? And so you'll see various different things out there, um, different people advocating for different forms of probe cover, right, um, ranging from tegaderm all the way up to uh, a sterile sleeve, and uh, essentially the way we deal with this here is we want our people to use the um, the sterile sleeves. Not that ultrasound guided peripheral venous access is a sterile procedure per se. We want to make it as clean as possible, but we're not, you know, sterile gloving, draping the patient, dealing with it like OR level sterile technique. But uh, we want the long sheath uh, catheter uh, to be um, to be used to protect the the patient from the probe and the probe from the patient. Right. Um, we used to use the tegaderms and by from a physics standpoint, they technically probably worked, right? Um, I forget exactly what the um, the pore size on tegaderms were, but it's quite small. I think it's like 120 microns. Um, 
you know, was the pore size on tegaderms, which when you compared it to the common bacteria that we're dealing with, would be adequate to block the bacteria and viruses that we, that we worry about. Um, but my read of things is that the tegaderms aren't necessarily approved by regulator, regulatory bodies, and there's some potential effects that the adhesive could have on the head of the probe. And so we tend to just say, look, we've got a whole bunch of these sterile sleeves for sterile procedures. We're going to continue to utilize these for our non-sterile procedures. And so if you're doing an ultrasound line here at Metro Health, what we want you to use for your for your probe cover is just grab one of those sterile probe covers and use that, right? And that's what we're going to use to protect our probe from, um, from the patient and the patient from the probe, right? Now, this gets to the next question is, well, what disinfection uh, disinfectant should I use on the patient? Um, and I'm going to just go out there and say, do not, under any circumstances in our hospital, use betadine uh, to to disinfect the patient before you use before you do your ultrasound guided line, largely because well, there's two reasons. Number one, for betadine to work appropriately and work correctly, you have to put it on, apply it to the patient, and then allow it to dry, which is going to take several minutes, and that's several minutes of time that I don't have the um, the the patience for, uh, nor do I have the time for if I'm going to be doing a lot of things on my shift, right? The second and big reason is betadine stains the head of the probes, right? Now you could argue that, well, you're putting a probe cover on, so who really cares? Um, but the reality is we'd prefer you not to use betadine uh, for those two reasons, because uh, it makes a lot of work for us to clean the probes afterwards, as well as it's not probably being utilized appropriately by the provider to begin with. And so to that end, we'd like you to use the chloroprep sticks that we have. So we have a whole bunch of these ones in the foil wrappers, but we also have the ones that are um, kind of the chloroprep sponges that can be utilized as well. And this is the preferred disinfectant here uh, when we do these procedures, right? So you get your, your chloroprep stick to clean the patient. And the remainder of the stuff that you need is your typical catheter, right? Uh, your flush, your J-loop. Um, and then what I like is these stat locks, right? Uh, so, and I not sponsored by any of these products. And so if I talk about a, a proprietary product, it's mostly because I tend to use it and like it, not because I'm getting any money out of the thing. Um, but um, the the catheters that we use um, are the 1.88 inch catheters, right? If you use the standard uh, 1.2 or 1.4 uh, inch catheter, I forget exactly what it is. They're not going to be long enough to get into the vessel and stay in the vessel. And you're going to tend to have a lot of lines slipping out. So you want to use the long catheters, the 1.88 inch catheters, because they're going to have the length that you need to get into the vessel and have enough catheter remaining in the vessel so they don't fall out, right? Um, either in the the 18 or 20 gauge is what we tend to use. Um, and then from a, the, you know, securing it to the patient, I really like these stat locks, right? So you have basically this plasticized material. It's on the bottom right here, the plasticized material with um, kind of uh, an adhesive on the butterfly wings there. Uh, and that plasticized material fits nicely over little ridges on the the, the Anju cath, right? And so with a little bit of, um, you know, adhesive um, material like that tincture um, that's on, that's right next to it, the skin prep, um, those stat locks stick nicely uh, and hold the ultrasound catheter in or the, the IV catheter in. And what you'll notice, right, is if you just put a straight tegaderm on, you've just used ultrasound gel on the patient, right? You put the catheter in. Um, and when you wipe that gel off, there's a slight gel residue that's left on the patient's skin that tends to be sticky or uh, tends to be uh, slippery and does not allow the adhesive of that tegaderm to, to stick well to the patient, right? And so once you put, uh, so it, it tends to not secure it well, right? So I find that if you put the stat locks on, it really secures down that um, that IV line allows you to get a better clean and then a better adhesive um, you know, a better adhesion with the the tegaderm that goes over top of the the whole thing. And so that's how I like to do it at the the materials that I like. Um, and this is what we stock when we do our ultrasound lines here um, at the hospital, right? So we've talked about the anatomy. We've talked about the equipment. Let's talk a little bit about some basic ultrasound principles that we need to remember uh, as we apply this to the patient, right? And some of this is gonna be a lot of review, especially for this audience, but maybe it's a good time to go back and review it, right? So ultrasound in general, big picture, 30,000 foot view, see the whole landscape all at once. Ultrasound, medical ultrasound is the graphical display of reflected sound waves, right? So I 
you know, emit a sound into the body, right? The body does something with that sound and returns that sound back to me. It's an echo, right? It's the same thing as if I'm standing out in my yard yelling at my barn, right? And I hear my, whatever I said, echoing back to me, right? Um, so what the body then does to those sound waves affects what the machine hears back. And that machine then displays in a graphical form what it hears back, right? Um, now, the sound exists on a spectrum, right? So this is a sound spectrum uh, and it ranges from really, really low to really, really high frequencies, right? And so if you think about lower frequencies, it's the the frequencies that we use to to talk, right? The, the frequencies that you're using to hear my voice or that my voice is utilizing so that you can hear me, right? Is gonna be kind of in that audible range, kind of that 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz type range, right? Um, if you go hop in your car and turn on the radio, assuming you don't use podcasts like I do, if you actually turn on the legit radio and tune it into some station, right? That's going to be up in the 80 to 102-ish megahertz frequency, right? That's just your regular radio frequencies. So somewhere in the middle of all that is ultrasound, right? And ultrasound lives in about the 1 to 20 megahertz frequency. So it's just the, the wave, you know, this, you know, electromechanical wave that happens right along this frequency spectrum ultrasound sits right in there and so all the principles that apply in physics that govern my voice and the radio also apply to ultrasound right and so what the machine does is it sends these short bursts of sound into well out of the probe and you know, because we're putting on a patient into the patient's body, right? And it sends it out at a particular frequency and at a particular rate. Um, that rate is adjustable based on the depth that you set and things like that. Um, and then it listens back in those pauses. So it sends a pulse and listens and sends a pulse and listens. And what it hears back, then it will display as your image. And so when you get things coming back, if it takes less time than other signals to get back, it displays it higher up on the screen. If it comes back at a loud, a higher amplitude or a louder, you know, volume, essentially, it displays as brighter. If it comes back as a lower amplitude or a lower volume, there's been attenuation, it's going to display it as darker, right? And so with all of those echoes returning back, then the machine can kind of map out, you know, where this thing is coming from and kind of what the picture looks like. And all of a sudden, you know, that square and that circle that you you know, bounce the sound waves off of can be displayed on the screen in something that resembles reality, right? And so that's how medical ultrasound works. And now just take it instead of a square in a box, right? Make it the complexity of the human body, right? So you have the liver and the kidney and the spleen and all these other things, right? That, you know, that reflect sound waves in various different ways and different attenuations and how it scatters. And then you get this variety and this variegation uh, of, of the color of the grayscale in the, in this case, um, and the location that represents the human body. And so one of the ways that I like to think about it is kind of imagine yourself walking in the woods, right? And you have a flashlight and it's kind of foggy, right? Um, if you shine the flashlight, you're going to get this beam that's emitted from the flashlight, right? And if you had a third party observer who's standing off to the side, looking kind of, they can see you and the beam spreading out in front of you, whatever that beam hits, right, is going to be what kind of analogous to what the machine's going to display on the ultrasound, right? And so you may see a tree and a rabbit and another tree and a deer and all these other things kind of in various different stages or in very different places, you know, distant from your beam. Um, and that's going to be kind of the representation of what you see on the ultrasound screen. Imagine your probes, the flashlight, and the body is kind of that woods in the fog. Uh, and you can kind of see those, those things that are displayed, if that makes any sense, right? So that's kind of how ultrasound's produced. Uh, now, one other thing is that science or medicine is the well science right is the art of the reproducible thing right um and medicine tends to be as scientific as possible right and so one of the things that we want to be able to do is reproduce what we the findings we have right to validate them right and so one of the ways that we do that is to standardize how we scan and so you'll notice on the machine like on the probe, there's a little dot, right? And on the screen, there's a little dot. And those that dot on the probe and that dot on the screen are represent the same side of the probe, right? And so um, whatever tends to be towards that dot on the probe tends to be towards that dot on the screen, right? It gives us the ability to have a, a, a handedness or a laterality to the image that we see on the screen. So by convention, we're going to orient things in a certain way for diagnostic ultrasound. And for procedural ultrasound, by convention, we want to orient that dot 
to you as the operator's left side, right? Mostly because when you look at the screen, the dot is gonna be on your left side, right? And so it's a whole lot easier for your mind to comprehend what's going on when you have the patient oriented the same way and the screen oriented the same way. So if you move your needle to the left, it actually goes to the left on the screen. If you move your needle to the right, it goes to the right on the screen. And so if you think about it, you know, this is totally different for um, diagnostic ultrasound, but for procedural ultrasound, right? You want that probe indicator to be to your left so that it ma minimizes the amount of confusion of things that you'll see on the screen, right? So that's kind of ultrasound basics. Let's take the next step and talk a little bit about machine ops, right? And how we can make this machine do the things that we want it to do so that we can get the outcome that we want, right? Because you have the car, right? The car does you no good if you don't know how to operate it, right? If you don't know how to put the key in, turn it on, push the pedal, actually get it out of, or get it into drive, push the pedal and steer the thing, right? So just like a car has certain functions that it can do and features that it has um, that make the experience either easier or a whole lot more comfortable and pleasurable, um, the machine here does the same thing, right? So there's some three basic functions we want to cover and then five or four different uh, settings that we can do to make things better, right? And so the, the three basic functions are this 2D or B mode, M mode, and Doppler, right? And so 2D mode is essentially just drive. You, know, you put your car in drive and boom, you're off to the races, right? It is going to be the standard scanning mode where you get just this 2D image of what's going on inside the body displayed on your screen, right? It's in the grayscale. It's kind of when you associate ultrasound with something, it's it's this, right? And so um, the picture on the right here is our procedure machine. Um, and I usually give this lecture to our, our nurses uh, to teach them how to do this. And so I want to show them the machine that they're going to be utilizing. Um, but it's that bottom right button, that 2D button on the screen. And one of the things that I like to say is generally, if you get yourself lost in some window, some setting something around there most machines if you hit 2d or b or whatever represents that function it kind of brings you back to this home screen right and so that's going to be the majority of what we're going to do um when we do ultrasound guided vascular access the other modes i'm going to tell you about just to, so you know about them but not really going to need to utilize them for vascular access procedures right um so the second mode is called doppler this would be analogous to let's say putting it into you know putting your car into that you know, a different gear, right? Or putting it in reverse or something like that, uh, putting it in a different function. Uh, and so Doppler is essentially a color overlay or color or graphical overlay um, on top of the 2D mode that allows us to see movement, right? Allows us to see the movement of something, generally blood inside vascular structures, right? You can see, um, utilize the Doppler principle to show movement of something toward or away from the probe, um, and depending on what type of Doppler you're using, using, you either qualify it as in color Doppler or quantify it with spectral Doppler, we can actually get a velocity of movement in that structure, right? And so we've had a lot of lectures on that over the course of the time uh, on the YouTube channel. You can go back and look at, you know, you know, practical examples of Doppler on some of our cardiac videos. Um, but that being said, in this context, it's something that you can utilize to see flow. And so sometimes what I'll do if I want to confirm, you know, where vascular structures are, if it's a difficult patient, is you can throw color on, um, angle toward or away from, um, you know, from perpendicular. You don't want it to be perfectly perpendicular, but toward or away from that, and then see what lights up. And that gives me, okay, now this is where my eyes need to focus, then turn it off and I can adjust my other settings to, to optimize that image, right? And so that's something you can utilize. The third function is called M mode, right? Um, and so this is basically another motion mode where it shows um, everything under a certain line. So you can see on the top part of the screen, there's a, a heart and there's a line that's that's going through the heart. So everything underneath that line displayed out over time. So um, you can see in the bottom part that that display is basically millisecond by millisecond. The, the what you would have seen on the screen, right? Displayed over, over a period of time. So in this situation, we see the movement of that mitral valve uh, through the passive filling, the E wave and the atrial kick, the A wave uh, over three beats there, right? Um, so I'm not seeing the movement of the blood flow, right? That's Doppler, but I'm seeing the movement of the valve in particular, because that's what my line's going through um, as this heart's going through its cardiac cycle. And in the context of ultrasound guided procedures, it's not really a function that we utilize a lot something we use more in things like a cardiac application or an OB application where we're really looking for, you know, 
what what particular movement is happening in a structure or is there like a heartbeat you know in in our our first trimester ob studies so I, so mentioned it there just to kind of round things out but that leads us to the four basic functions that we want to be able to utilize to appropriately do our study or to in the analogy that we're using to drive our car right and so this would be like turning on your headlights honking your horn flipping on your windshield wipers and I don't know, turning on the radio, doing something else, right? Um, so the first one is preset. Pretty much every machine you encounter is going to have presets, right? They come straight from the factory with certain presets. And then most machines allow you to be able to customize presets to your liking. So if there's a particular application that you want to tweak and make it for just you, uh, you can customize that and save that. And so a lot of our machines um, have the standard factory presets, and then we've tweaked some to kind of fit the way we like it to work, right? And basically what these presets do is they say, here's all the different things that the machine can do, depth and focus and gain and, you know, grayscale maps and all sorts of other stuff. We're going to set it and do a preset so that when you hit this button, all those change to what you want, right? And it's application specific because for cardiac, I want something totally different than if I'm doing a fast exam or if I'm doing, you know, a first trimester or a gallbladder or something like that. And so by doing preset, I can, you know, instead of having to go fix 20 different things, I can set them all at once, right? And so the first thing you're gonna wanna do when you're doing your stu any study is pick the preset that most closely approximates the study that you're intending to do, right? And so in this situation, you know, if there's a vascular axis or a venous or a superficial, you know, preset, that's the one you wanna pick because it's gonna basically set all the other parameters for you um, and optimize things a little bit. Now, from there, you're gonna have to tweak things a little bit. Um, and the next one's gonna be gain, right? So gain is essentially how um, brightly does the machine display the signal that's coming back. So it has nothing to do with the amount of signal that's sent into the patient's body. It really doesn't do any, have anything to do with how much is sent back to the body, but when that the machine receives that signal, right? How much amplification does it have to apply to, to view that on the screen, right? So if you turn your gain down, it's gonna be really, really dark. If you turn your gain up, it's going to be really, really bright, right? And so you want to find that sweet spot in the middle where your highlights are not blown out, right? And your shadows are not all muddy, uh, where you can kind of see this nice broad range of of um, of grayscale in your image, right? And I can't say that there's a perfect gain setting, right? I've never learned you have to go to this setting. It's always, you kind of tweak it until you find out what's just right. And for those who are, you know, who enjoy photography, or image manipulation on the computer. This isn't a hard concept to get your head around, right? This is the same as the, the brightness slider uh, in a lot of your photo apps, um, you know, or kind of adjusting your exposure on your camera, um, you know, to, to, to turn up or turn down the brightness uh, of your image, right? So that's gain. The next feature is called depth, right? And it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. How much penetration are you asking the machine to perform or to, to, to give you, right? Are you looking at five centimeters or are you looking at 15 centimeters? Uh, and you can actually adjust how much you're trying to, um, how deep you want to look into that body. And so what I generally tell people with vascular axis is find the structure that you want and put it at least in the middle of the screen, if not the lower third of the screen, because everything deep to that you know, assuming you're not backwalling that vessel is wasted space because you're not intending to put a needle there, right? You all you what you want to do is you want to maximize the amount of space between the vessel and the skin, right? That, that near field. And so make that as big on the screen as you possibly can. And so in this example, we're looking at the aorta, right? You can see the the vertebral body shadow deep to the aorta, and all that shadow is just wasted space. Like there's nothing diagnostic back there that I really want to look at. And so if I adjust my depth. So like that shadow is at the bottom of the screen that maximizes my ability to see things in the, the field between the, the vertebral bodies and the skin. So I can get a better diagnostic view of what's going on inside that patient. The next one that we want to talk about a little bit is frequency, right? And generally speaking, each machine will have some button that allows you to change the frequency, right? Um, it may be coded in some, you know, language that would um, suggest the application as opposed to, you know, the physics. But basically, um, 
it's going to be a button that's going to toggle between, you know, a general a penetration or resolution mode, or you can toggle through, you know, a frequency setting. Um, but what that's going to allow you to do is adjust that balance between do I want to see deep in the body or do I want to see sharply, right? And so if you do it on the, free, the, the, the resolution mode, you're going to see more of a crisp image, but you're going to not, you're going to lose out on some of your depth ability. Whereas if you go to more of a penetration mode, it's going to, things are going to look a little bit fuzzier, but you're going to be able to kind of penetrate a little bit more deeply. And in this situation, the, the skin and superficial or the skin and soft tissue where we're doing the vascular axis, probably we're shallow enough that it's not going to have a huge effect, but it certainly can be a, you know, a game changer as you're scanning kind of abdominal, um, you know, applications and looking for looking a little bit more deeply in the body. So uh, mention it there. And the final um, um, function is the freeze function. We're just going to need to know this, right? This freezes the screen, allows you to cine back and find the image that you want for um, for your documentation, right? So with all that background in mind, let's talk about the procedure, like how we actually do this thing, right? How do we use the ultrasound to guide a needle into a vessel, right? And some tips and techniques that I've found over the years that have been helpful. Um, and then, you know, the, the other aspect that unfortunately this video can't help us with is just, you got to do it because you need to not only learn the, the didactics of how it works, but also just the, the psychomotor cord or hand, hand eye coordination to be able to, to make the thing happen. Right. Um, but let's talk about the procedure for a little bit. So, indications for this procedure um, in our protocol, right? This is the protocol. I took this from the protocol that we've um, adapted for our nurses, right? Um, what gets you into this, this line of thinking is essentially two failed landmark attempts, right? A history of needing a ultrasound guided IV in the past, or you look at the patient like, there is no way I'm going to get this with you know landmarks. I need to to use my ultrasound, right? Those are the three things that my nurses can rely on to, to get them in the protocol. You know, as physicians, we can maybe expand that a little bit. Um, you know, if someone's coming to me for IV access, you know, I'm not good just doing it by landmarks because my nurses are amazing, right? And so I'm probably just going to go to ultrasound to begin with, you know, because you know it's going to help me get it. Now, on the flip side, they're probably not coming to me for access because they've, you know, unless they've like ridiculously failed and they need the ultrasound. So um you know, whatever you happen to write is your protocol. This happens to be ours, you know, because I needed to have a way of telling the nurses, okay, here's what you do, right? Here's when you do it. And here's when you don't do it. So this is kind of what gets you into the, into the procedure for us. Right. Um, so that's the first step is find someone where the, you know, the procedure is indicated. Right. Um, and the next step is go through and find the, the, the target that you're going to be looking for. So, you know, put the, um, put the rubber band tourniquet on, scan up and down the arm, find a structure that's going to be suitable for you being able to do it, right? And criteria that are uh, good for suitability is number one, it's a vein, right? So it's anechoic and compressible. And number two, it tends, the veins that tend to do well with whole sun guided lines is veins that are within a centimeter and a half of, you know, from the skin surface, right? And if you think about it, geometrically speaking, if you get further than that, you know, or deeper than that, deeper than a centimeter and a half, some people, maybe we can push it to two you're not going to have enough catheter length to stay in the vessel. Cause you have to think how much catheter am I, am I going to spend getting to that vessel? Cause you're not going straight down. Right. So I'm going to be spending at least, you know, at the very minimum, if I, if my depth is a centimeter and a half, you know, probably closer to two, two and a quarter, you know, centimeters. Right. So I'm already up to maybe even two and a half. So I'm already up to, you know, an inch, right. Uh, of catheter length just to get into the vessel and now I have to have a significant amount of catheter in the vessel so it doesn't just fall out. And this is why we use the 1.88 inches, like the almost two inch catheters, because in that scenario, if I'm at my total depth of a centimeter and a half, um, you know, it's going to it's going to leave me just on just under like three quarters of an inch uh, a catheter in that vessel. And you can do the math, right? If you go in at a perfect 45 degree angle, um, you know, whatever your depth down times, you know, the square root of two, which my, my memory serves me correctly is 1.7 ish. Um that doesn't sound right. Anyway, um, whatever that length is, you're going to have to be longer than that to get your catheter in the vessel, right? Um, other criteria that would, you know, be important for, for vessel selection is, is it something that's going to be a decently large and decently straight vessel, right? Some vessels are so small that, you know, you can put a, put a needle in it, but it's just small enough that you're not going to be able to get that catheter to easily thread because it's just ridiculously, ridiculously teeny, you know? On the other hand, 
you know, you may have a large vessel that just has this tortuous path. And so you get the catheter in and you're just curve after curve after curve that you're going to have to negotiate. And so finding that balance between something that's superficial enough, large enough, large tends to be, you know, relative to your skill level, and then straight enough that you're not going to be constantly like going into, you know, a valve or to a Y junction, you know, or, um, or some curve, you know, that you have a little bit of a runway to land your catheter once you're inside that vessel. Right. And so the first key thing after you've started is just scan up and down the patient's arm and find the vessel that's really appropriate to utilize, right? Spend a little bit of time preparing and planning and thinking through, okay, how, like, where can I poke the skin? How is it going to not be affected by the patient moving their arm? Where can I land this thing? Uh, so I can, I can set myself up for success. Right. And then the next step after you kind of got all your supplies ready is okay, how am I going to approach this in plane versus out of plane, right? And I'm going to spend a little bit of time teaching you the out of plane technique, because I think that's probably the the better technique um, to do um, ultrasound guided uh, peripheral venous access. Um, but there are some nuances to that. And there are some pitfalls that you got to know of. Um, so a little bit about the out of plane technique, essentially what it is, is putting your your ultrasound probe perpendicular to the direction of, of the vessel, right? So you can see the vessel in cross section and then guiding a needle into that vessel. Again, uh, the needle's trajectory is perpendicular to that ultrasound transducer, right? Um, and so what you're going to see is a small portion of that vessel and a small portion of that needle at any one point in time. But what you gain is the ability to track the needle, um, you know, as it goes deep, but also see the structures around it to know what you are kind of going towards or what you're not going towards, right? Um, so here's an example. Uh, the advantages of an out of plane technique is better view of the vein and the surrounding structures, right? So if there's an artery there, you know not to hit it. There's a you know a nerve there, you know not to hit it. You um, can kind of see if your needle is too far to the left, too far to the right, if it's deep or if it's superficial, you know, superficial things like that. So you can see all the surrounding structures, right? And so it's easier to track the needle relative to where the vein's at to make corrections on your way to that vein. The disadvantage is you only see a small sliver of that needle at any one point in time. And so it's really easy to lose track of your needle tip if you're not very careful. Um, and so it puts you at risk for a double wall puncture. And I'm going to just pop out here and just show an example, right? Um, so when I teach, teach this, I always like to say my phone, right, is my ultrasound transducer, right? So here's my ultrasound transducer and my pen is my needle. And so the out of plane technique, you're essentially driving your needle like this and following it with your, your transducer, right? And showing that it's approaching the target that you want, right? But you can see that it's easy to get your needle farther than you think it is. And, you know, while you may think that your needle is kind of up here where the ultrasound beam intersects with it, you're actually down here, right? So that's the disadvantage, but the advantage is you get to make these left, right correction. So if I'm scanning like this, right, I can go in and I can go to the left, go to the right, I can go down, I can go up. You can see all of that, um, you know, as you're actually doing your procedure, right? Com contrast that with the out of plane technique or the in plane technique, where you are actually watching the whole needle go in, you know, in real time, but you only get this narrow slice of what's actually going on. And so if you get your needle off plane, or your vessel off plane, it becomes really, really challenging, right? So that is the the out of plane um, technique and the why we do it. Now, how do we get this done, right? Um, what I have found is that you need to be very methodical in your procedure, right? Um, it's easy to get in, right, to get lost and then start freaking out, at least inside your head, and then make some really bad decisions about what you do to get yourself out of the situation. So a um, couple basic principles. You want to lead with your sound, right? Um, and you want to always know where your needle tip is, right? And you advance your needle into the beam of the transducer, right? And so those three basic principles, let's talk a little bit about how, how you do it. So essentially, you find your vessel, right? Put your probe over where you think you want to land that needle inside the vessel, right? You mentally or just physically calculate the distance to that vessel, right? And you can see there's oftentimes a little, little scale on the side of the, the, the screen. It'll give you the centimeter marks, right? And you can kind of estimate, okay, I'm about a centimeter down, right? And so you say, okay, this vessel, 
is about a centimeter from the skin surface, right? So if I were to do a perfect 45 degree angle, right? And insert my needle in the patient's skin and land that needle right where that probe is, I would need to insert the, the needle in the skin a centimeter behind the probe, right? So there is where that kind of, you can use a, you know, the, the geometry, right? To kind of make that estimation and insert your needle into the skin surface you know, behind the probe. So cutting back here, let's kind of slow this down here for a minute. Here's your, your um, ultrasound probe, right? Your vessel is down here. So there's a certain distance that I need to travel to get to the, the vessel. If I take that distance and estimate kind of what that is, I can say, therefore my insertion needs to be behind the probe that same distance, right? Going at about 45 degree angle. So get in the skin surface, just like that, okay? Once you're in the skin surface, right? Or once you, once you figure that out, insert your needle just underneath the skin, right? You're not doing anything other than, I want to get under the skin, just a quick pop, just to get, get through the skin and then stop, right? Physically stop yourself. You're under the skin, stop. Now move your transducer back to the, the, the needle. Right. So if we go back to my example here, so you get in, boom, I'm in. Now move your transducer back to the needle. Right. You aren't moving the needle, yet. you're moving the transducer back to the needle. Okay. Once you've done that, you find your, your needle tip. Right. You can do that um, basically by, let me just switch back here again. You get back to the needle. Okay. You find that needle tip. You can make these teeny tiny little movements to see that movement there move your transducer away, see it goes away, right? Move it back, it shows back up. Okay, I know I'm at the needle tip, right? So once you found that needle tip, then advance your transducer, right? You can see how the transducer is advanced and then move the needle in till, you, till it shows back up again. Then advance your transducer, move the needle until it shows back up again. All right, and we're gonna see examples of this here. Um, so it's basically leapfrogging with your transducer and with your needle. So you move your transducer away so you no longer see your needle. Insert your needle further till it shows back up. Move your transducer away so you no longer see it. Insert your needle so it shows back up. And by doing that, being, being very methodical about that, you know that you're at the needle tip at all times. And if you get lost, right, stop, move your transducer back to the one place in, pla in one point in place and time that you know where that needle is, and that is at the skin surface, right? and find that needle needle shaft and work your way back down the shaft and the needle until you get to the tip, right? And once you've re rediscovered the tip, then you can proceed on with your procedure, right? And so what we see in this clip here is an example of, you see that kind of shimmer show up in the near field and then you move your probe away so it disappears and you insert it a little bit more and then it shows back up again. You can see it showing back up again a little bit deeper, right? If we do kind of advance to the next one, you see it now eventually showing up inside that vessel. Right. Um, so you kind of do that leapfrog until you get to the vessel, right? And you insert it into that vessel. Oftentimes when you get that to so get through that vessel wall, you need just a quick sharp pop, and that gets that needle tip inside the vessel, right? And you'll see this bright thing show up in the lumen, right? At this point, you are really only about half done, right? If you try to thread the catheter right now, I guarantee you you will fail, right? And I guarantee you that because that's where I was for a long, long time. Um so the next step you want to do is start advancing further in the vessel. And if you think about this, right, go to the bedside. If you're a physician, right, go to the bedside and watch your nurses put in an ultrasound line or not an ultrasound line, put in any line. There's a particular technique that they use where they put the, vest, the, the catheter or the needle in, right? And then there's a hook that they do with their wrist as they kind of get in that vessel, right? And we're going to replicate that hook in these next series of steps, right? And that hook is really transitioning from I got in the vessel to I want to get further, far enough in that the catheter threads on smoothly, right? And so when we go back to the ultrasound, put your position your needle inside the very center of the lumen, like the bullseye center of the lumen. You can see, and there's oftentimes some mobility there. So you can see how kind of I'm moving the needle a little bit back and forth, right? Um, you can probably even move it up and down a little bit. Um, by flattening out, by raising it up, you can kind of, there's a little bit of movement there, not a ton, a little bit of movement. So position that needle in the dead center of that vessel, right? And then move your transducer away so that the needle disappears. And then 
advance your needle until it shows back up again, right? Now, I guarantee you it's going to show up towards the bottom of that vessel, right? Uh, in which case, you flatten out your needle to put it back in the center, adjust your left and right, and repeat that procedure. You move your needle or move your uh, transducer a little bit further away, right? And, and I'm talking about millimeters here, and then insert your needle until it shows back up, okay? Flatten out a little bit more, move your transducer, insert your needle, right? And you do this, you know, three times or so, uh, and you get, you basically what you're doing is you're getting that needle and that catheter far enough in the vein so that when you have that slight you know, jarring movement of setting your probe down and trying to advance your catheter, it's going to go on smooth, right? Um, and what I've found is since I've started doing this technique, my success rate has risen dramatically. One of my medics taught this technique to me years ago, um, and doing this simple technique uh, really helps improve your ability to get this ultrasound done or this ultrasound line done, right? And, it, and as I was thinking about it and kind of watching what I was doing and watching what my nurse is doing, I realized it's the exact same technique they're using with landmarks where they just kind of that hook of the wrist. I'm just breaking it down step by step by step by step with my ultrasound machine. And so um, with that said, here's a video um, we're going to play here in just a sec. This is actually the other day, one of, um, one of my nurses was doing a line on me. So I'm the patient here. So I've consented myself uh, to be, publicly displayed. Um, and essentially, um, what you'll see is it's subtle, but watch uh, how he does it. He gets the, the the catheter in, right? We go in a little bit deep uh, because it's such a superficial vessel, uh, has to redirect a little bit. But then once he's in that vessel, watch, you'll see the transducer move, and then you'll see the needle move. And I'll, I'll narrate this as we kind of go through it here. Um, but essentially, we get in, right? And you can see a little bit of movement just to the left-hand side of that vessel. See, we're a little bit deep, so he redirects and gets inside the lumen of the vessel right there, right? And now we can see that that catheter there. He tries to center it up and does moves the transducer a little bit and then inserts the needle a little bit further. You see it show back up, right? And then he'll move the transducer. And then the needle will kind of, you see at the bottom of the lumen there, He's kind of looking, kind of advancing kind of what else is there, coming back, seeing it in the center of the screen, moves it, inserts it a little more. And eventually he gets to the point where he's done it enough times that he will thread that catheter on. Coming up here in just a minute. You see that subtle movement where he moves the transducer and then advances the, the needle, moves the transducer, advances the needle. And now the catheter goes on really smoothly. And we can see the catheter that's left in the lumen of the vessel. Right? J-loop is attached. And the rest is history. So that there is the basic procedure, right? And I think the key is to really discipline yourself to be very methodical. You move the transducer so you no longer see the needle. You advance the needle until it shows up. Right, you move the transducer so they long, no longer see it. Advance the needle so it shows back up, and if you keep that in the center of the lumen, once you've kind of achieved your initial flash and you know and, and um, axis of the vessel, and do that at several times, then the catheter will slide on pretty smoothly. So, uh, a couple troubleshooting things here um, that you may run into because you do this enough, and you're going to run into some issues. Right, uh, if you get lost, right, stop everything. Right, stop moving your needle. Moving your needle is not going to help you get unlost. You need to basically backtrack a little bit, find your bearings, get your bearings, get your landmarks, and then move forward. And so that's why I say move the trend, the transducer back to that point where the, the needle enters the skin, right? The point of entry, and then follow that needle signature down the needle until you get back to the, the needle tip, right? Um, and there can be some slight like wiggling movements just to kind of help highlight that, that needle shimmer. Um, but don't continue moving your needle further in if you don't know where your your uh, needle tip is, right? Uh, and so that's really the main thing that's going to help you troubleshoot. Sometimes you just have to back out um, and kind of reapproach it. But first, stop. Try to troubleshoot it with your transducer, not with your needle, right? A couple pitfalls. Obviously, trying to put a catheter in a thrombos thrombose vessel is not going to work well, right? So hopefully you've done a good pre-scan. You know that the vessel is patent uh, in the area that you're trying to go for. Um, so obviously don't do it in the thrombose vessel. Um, it's not uncommon, especially as you're training, to do a double wall puncture, right? To get further down 
uh, inside the arm than you really think you are. And when you do that, it generally tends to be a failure to be disciplined and meticulously follow the, the steps that we outlined. And when you kind of stop, back up, and be very careful about knowing where your needle tip is, advancing a small amount, you're advancing your transducer a small amount, then your needle a small amount, and doing that repeatedly over and over again, you tend to be terribly successful, right? Um, other pitfalls, obviously, you poke the wrong thing. Um, however, one of the reasons why we do ultrasound guided lines is that it allows us to avoid poking the wrong thing, right? To poke, uh, avoid poking the artery or avoid poking the nerve. And so, um, you know, while it can be a pitfall, it's also one of the benefits is that you have a decreased risk of um, arterial puncture or of a nerve puncture when you're operating near those structures, right? Um, so here's an example of just something that's too deep, right? You can see that needle shimmer that's, you know, gone through the vessel. Um, it's just, you weren't careful when you were going through um, knowing where your needle tip is. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't briefly explain what the in-plane technique is. And that's essentially turning the transducer 90 degrees. So you're following the plane of the needle and the vessel, right? Uh, and these give beautiful images, right? No one's going to say that this image is, is you know, horrible because it's just, you get to see the needle uh, move in its full trajectory. The hard thing, right, is that it is very difficult to align three narrow structures, right? So the ultrasound beam has a beam width of about what? About a millimeter. The needle has a, a needle width of about a millimeter and the vessel may be a couple millimeters across, right? And so to keep all three of those in line um, is actually really challenging. Um, so it's a valid technique can be used. There's some literature that would support it. Uh, however, I think it's difficult um, to do that. And there's the additional disadvantage of you don't get to see what's around the vein. So if there's a nerve, if there's a an artery, you don't get to see those, have that situational awareness of kind of what you're, you know, what you're operating around, right? So with that being said, I'll leave you with a couple of tips for success and they'll wrap things up, right? Number one, follow your target, you know, approximately to distally before you do your procedure, right? Scan, know your territory that you're operating in. Um, and that gives you an ability to really identify the prime target of where you want that needle to land inside the body. And then from there, you can kind of backtrack and say, okay, from, from that place, where do I need to insert my needle in the skin so that I can hit where I want to land, right? Um, find the place where the vessel is the most superficial is possible or is, is the closest to the skin surface as possible, right? It's going to be a lot harder to hit it deeper than it will be to hit it shallower. That being said, sometimes that's not the best place because it's just really, you know, small caliber superficial. And if you go up or down a couple centimeters, it becomes bigger within an acceptable depth range. And so it's all about finding the balance of those different criteria that we utilize to, um, to find or to, to pick a target, but generally superficial is going to be one of the, the prime prime reasons for why you pick a target, right? The third thing, and this didn't, we didn't really talk about this much today, although we've talked about in other uh, lectures, is position yourself in a position of comfort, right? For yourself and for the patient, right? There's a, if you want more on this, go back, we watched it. We did a video um, a couple of years ago about the ergonomics of ultrasound, right? Um, but basically, if you put position yourself uh, in a position of comfort, it really enhances your ability to get that thing done. Not only just you're not uncomfortable, but like if you put even as little as put the machine in a place where you can look directly up from the arm and you can see the machine. So you're not craning your neck to look around and find these other, you know, really weird angles, right? You'll hurt yourself and it will decrease your success if you have to do something funny. So sit down, get the arm next to you, get the machine in front of you, position everything for in a position of comfort, right? Um, going along with that, have your supplies at the bedside, right? Put all your supplies together, have them in easy reach, easy visual view so that you're not, again, turning around, trying to keep things steady while you're finding some supplies, just have it all ready to go. That's really going to set you up for success. And the last one, this was put in, um, you know, not by someone kind of who put portions of this lecture together. Um, yeah, if you might need some anesthetics. I generally don't do mine with topical anesthetics. I know I had, when I was a resident, I had one attending who one time made me do um, a little lidocaine before a um, an arterial puncture for like an ABG. Um, I'm not entirely sure it provided a ton of relief because you're already poking the patient for that. Um, but if the situation you know dictates, or if it's a central line or something like that, maybe a little bit of topical anesthetic uh, to decrease the discomfort of the patient uh, may be helpful. Or I mean, maybe we can talk about kiddos, right? You have those 
um, either distraction devices or a cold topical device that kind of provides a brief mono anesthetic before you have to make your poke, um, things just to make the patient's life a little bit easier. So anyway, that's kind of what I got for ultrasound guided vascular access. Um, you know, the, the basics of the anatomy, the machines, the operations, the procedure itself, how you get it done. And you can take this procedure and then start applying it to various different vessels in the periphery and in the central vascular area. Um, and you'll start seeing these techniques kind of replicate over and over again um, in various different vessels. So with that being said, any questions uh, about this topic, um, you know, or things that pertain to ultrasound guided vascular access?